you you've mentioned working with Carl Sagan a few times and you you earned your PhD in physics under him, correct? Yes. So obviously, you know, Carl Sagan, he's one of the most renowned scientists and, and science communicators of all time. What was it like working alongside him and having him as a resource? What what was, what was he like both as a, as a scientist and also as a person to talk to? Well, Carl was a very friendly guy, you know, and he was very busy when I worked with him because he was busy with his TV show and other kinds of things. And so I'd stand by the elevator, wait for him to go down the elevator. I could talk to him for about five minutes before he rushed off to his airplane or something like that. But no, he was yeah. a very friendly, personable type guy. Uh, you know, there was a biography written of Carl in the early days of planetary exploration. Uh, and, you know, the person who wrote the article said, oh, well, meeting Carl was like meeting a talking horse. Um, and I... I thought about that for a while and you know Carl was, Carl was unusual in the sense that you know most science people would reject things that they thought was ridiculous were ridiculous mm. and Carl would go and study them so like aliens okay everybody's still excited about aliens are they visiting the earth you know most science people said well it's not very likely they're wasting their time hiding out on the earth you know, if they were going to come here, they'd probably just say, okay, here we are. We know all this stuff you don't know. Let us help you out. Or they'd say, oh, yeah. you look pretty good. You have lots of resources. We're going to take them, one or the other. Yeah. Uh, hiding out doesn't make much sense. But at any rate, Kerr wrote a whole book about it. You know, he got all kinds of people together, and they uh, investigated um, the various issues involved and how they would be detected and what these sightings might really be and so he actually investigated it, and he did that for a bunch of other things. Uh, so he was very open-minded, and you know, if you read his books, he wrote books about how the brain works and all kinds of other things that uh, weren't really things he studied. And he had an unusual background. He went to the University of Chicago as an undergraduate, and at the time there, they, they read the great books. So he, he learned a lot about literature from reading the great books. And uh, although it wasn't a great book, I remember one time I read one of his books. It was a little paperback, not very long. And in the mm. middle of it, there was a picture of a bunch of people walking in a ring with umbrellas. And I thought, what has this got to do with this book, which was about some planetary science problem? And uh, so, I, so finally I said, Carl, why do you have this picture of these people with the umbrella? And he said, oh, that's because their theory was all wet. And I thought, wow, yeah. that was pretty obscure. And then I came to discover how this book was written. So Carl didn't sit down and write things. He dictated them. Mm. So he was telling stories orally all the time. And in this particular mm. book, he'd been in the Jet Propulsion Laboratory on a planetary mission. He was driving back across the country in a Porsche with his wife and a child in the car, who I don't think was very old. And he wrote the book, Driving Across the Country in the Porsche. Um, so, wow! You know, if you tried to write a book, but driving across the country to Porsche with a young child is <laughs> not likely to help you write the book. Um, yeah, just paying attention on the road and driving the Porsche with a child in a car is a huge feat. So, right. writing uh, writing an entire book is uh, definitely next level. Right, and you know, if you brought up something to Carl, an idea, you know, he would likely respond in some way you would have never imagined. You know, he would likely come up with some other idea that, um, you know, made you think about it. It was probably a mm. silly idea. A lot of his ideas didn't make much sense. You know, they were just something inconsistent or wrong with them or mm. something like that. But he had a lot of ideas, you know, so he was constantly generating ideas, and some of them were good ideas. Uh, do you think he... Uh, do you think he put... he he was generating so many ideas in an effort to push the boundaries of the idea that was presented to him. I, I, I've, I've interviewed a bunch of music artists and, and something that a lot of music artists do. Everyone has their own spectrum of creativity, but you want to create a, a lot of music. You want to make a lot of bad songs so that you have a higher chance of making a good song and the bad songs also teach you how to make something that people are going to like, how to make something that's catchy. 
is that an approach that's parallel to how Carl Sagan thought about ideas, where even if this idea is wrong, it may cause me to think about something in a different way, or it may cause the person I'm talking to to tell me something, prompt a discussion? Uh, yes, I think that's all true. And I think he had a broad range of interests. So he saw connections that many people wouldn't see because he had thought about all these different things um, that were, you know, looked unrelated, but he could see some relations between them. And so he was trying to generate ideas. And, you know, Carl was a teacher. You know, that's what he was really, I think, one of the great teachers of history, you know, and he taught huge numbers of people about various things and you know huge i know many people who wrote him a letter and he responded and they consequently went into science or you know did something in response to carl communicating with them so he's very successful at that and you know i work, spent a lot of time working with jim pollock uh, who was one of was one of carl's major collaborators and uh, jim pollock had been carl's first student and he was the opposite of carl he was a very um, thorough, detail-oriented person. And so between them, they had a lot of ideas and they worked out a lot of detailed <laughs> responses. But, you know, Carl was not yeah. a detailed guy. He was going to go work out the details. Um, yeah. But, you know, Carl inspired lots of people to go do interesting things. You know, if you go look at his papers, there, there he has huge range of collaborators and people who wrote papers with him on all of kinds of topics. And, um, you know, I wrote several papers with Carl that he became first author of that he wrote hardly anything of. And yeah, they're still widely quoted because yeah. people think Carl wrote them instead of me. Yeah. And so that's interesting. And I, Yeah, it's, it seems like the type of person, as you describe uh, Carl Sagan, a generalist, he, he's obviously has a huge range of knowledge within certain areas, but he also had a wide range of interests. It seems like that type of thinking is becoming less and less popular. And I, I grew up playing baseball so that there's a very early pressure to specialize in what you're good at, especially in sports. And then when you go to college, it's all right, pick your major. By the time you're freshman, uh, by the, by the first semester, sophomore year, and this is what you're going to do for a very long time. It's not as popular to say, okay, have, have a, an area of focus where you become incredibly competent and knowledgeable, but then keep, you know, maybe 10%, 20% of your time open to explore other ideas that maybe are unrelated. And the only thing that you get out of it is that it's fun to do fun to study but also you may make connections down the line that you never would have thought at the time that will that will help you in your focused field yeah well carl was a baseball player too and uh he was proud of that um, but yeah i think he just had a huge range of experiences and he met so many people and you know at the time you know we were in the middle of the cold war and practically the only way that the United States and Russia had any intersection was through the space program. So Carl spent a lot of time working with Russian planetary scientists. You know, there were lots of Russians that came to Cornell and gave talks and got to go out to dinner with and meet. You know, some of them were still alive, actually. And, um, you know, so they, he was enriched because of all the people he met all over the world mm -hmm. as well. Uh, you know, and he was... I remember one time he came out to talk about something about nuclear winter and we were trying to figure out where to go out to dinner. And so I uh, organized a dinner at a Japanese restaurant that had these little separated rooms, you know, so we were sitting in this room with you know, maybe six of us or something like that. And you could see Carl was smiling and waving at somebody half all through the dinner and it turned out to be some little kid about six or eight years old who recognized Carl. You know, Carl, of course, went over and, sign something for him or said hello to him, you know, so that was a constant thing with him, you know, and he liked meeting people and was very outgoing. Yeah, he, he has that great quote that goes, uh, the nuclear arms race is like two sworn enemies standing waist deep in gasoline, one with three matches and the other with five. And it seems like a big part of the problem or the, the, the 
a big part of a potential solution to the nuclear arms race and humanity not blowing itself up is to provide a path for global leaders and military personnel decision makers to see the gasoline. I feel like there's so much there's so much pressure on the the shininess of the nuclear weapon and the f- instilling fear in your enemies and the mutually assured destruction, hair trigger, all that stuff we got into that no one takes a second to to look down and and say, "Oh shit, like we're both standing in gasoline. If I drop this match, we're both going to go up in flames eventually." Yeah, why in the world did the world, why did people build 70,000 nuclear weapons? You know, just un, un, unthinkable. I mean, the number of yeah. like 10 weapons on every target in the world or something. You know, just no yeah. point to it. it was, why? Is it just about money? Was it about race? Um, you know, what was the motivating factor for that is, is very unclear. Uh, yeah, I mean, I... I uh... <laughs> Maybe maybe it's the same reason that people buy a lot of shoes. I b- before the pandemic, I had about thirty pairs of shoes, and I wore maybe five of them. But I was just every few months, I would buy another pair of shoes. And over four or five years, I now have an entire shoe rack that's full of shoes. And now, ironically, I wear barefoot walking shoes, which aren't even shoes. And I had a lot of time to sit around, obviously, and think about why I made these purchases when everything was closed down. And the only thing I could think of is that when you have something new, when you create something new, it makes you feel good. You get that little boost, but then it's just something to look at. So maybe there's an element to building up this nuclear arsenal. Obviously, there's a ton of convoluted things and uh forces that go into why a country builds up a nuclear arsenal and and that's happened over decades but it is something cool to look at like it's cool for someone it's cool for putin or, or trump or biden whoever to go out to dinner and be like hey you know i just i just picked up this you know, this new warhead, we got it. I could show you in the hangar. Like we got it. You could see it after dinner or something. Like you would talk about buying a new car with your friends. I feel like there is a showing off, uh, dick measuring contest as they would, as they would say, which is a totally human trait. I do it. A lot of people do it. It's, it's just, you want to, yeah. you want people to know what you have. You want to be able to show it off. Sure. You know, well, uh, people who build bombs or, you know, I think there's 12,000 scientists at Los Alamos or something like that. Of course, they're not all building bombs or all kinds mm. of other things in society. But, you know, there's, there's certainly a, a feeling of competitiveness there and knowing what's going on. And, you know, if you're in the know, then it makes you feel good. And, oh, well, let's see, maybe we could build this new thing nobody ever built before. It's a challenge. And, you know, these are not about being evil or something like that. It's just human nature mm-hmm. to want to compete in your mm-hmm. job and do the best job you can, whatever the job is. Hey guys, this is a quick reminder to check out Auxoro Premium, the best deal in premium podcasting. On Auxoro Premium, you gain access to bonus episodes, the unlicensed therapy series, the ability to submit topic suggestions for the podcast, exclusive Ask Me Anything episodes, and the entire premium catalog for only five bucks per month. Go to auxoro.supercast.com, that's A-U-X-O-R-O.supercast.com to join the premium gang today.